Okay, so um, I'm really happy to be part of this discussion and this, this uh, symposium um, because it, it really, I mean, I think it's been difficult for me over the past year that this project has been around is for another to really situate it alongside a lot of other work happening um, in, in the field of, of AI, especially very driven by things like um, uh, the desire to regulate it. Uh, I'm more interested in how we know about it. And, uh, and it's also really um, sort of quite, quite sweet and thrilling to be able to speak right after Professor Whitelaw, whose work directly influences um, the project I'm gonna talk about. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about the provenance of this work as well as its ambitions as a pedagogical method, but also as a kind of critical reflection on how we frame and discursively shape this technology that we call AI. So a year ago, I launched A's for Another, and I'm gonna show you the site itself in a minute. Um, I launched A's for Another, a dictionary of AI as a pedagogical and teaching learning exercise, a classroom exercise. And I always wanted to remain that kind of project. I was doing a small seminar um, outside the university for people who were both um, enrolled in universities, but were also not in university. And this was a small seminar in the last, uh, in the winter, just before the pandemic. So I worked with students to populate um, or sort of ge generate entries for what I imagined would be a dictionary that tried to disturb the notion of what a dictionary is, both in terms of its content, but also in terms of the way we interact with and what we understand a dictionary to be. So for example, when you consult a dictionary, it's a fairly solitary, top-down, very quick experience where you go, you look for the meaning of a word, you take that meaning as truth, and, and that's it, because the dictionary comes from Oxford. Um, but this is a dictionary of AI. And what I wanted to do with this dictionary is to ask, why have we assumed that there is one meaning of the word AI, of the words artificial and intelligent put together one after the other? Because the definition of AI in terms of a branch of computer science that attempts to build smart machines that mimic human intelligence immediately implicates these ideas of smartness and human and intelligence uh, that have shaped and deployed uh, that have been shaped and deployed in the world in particular ways. So um, on these slides, you can see. Um, uh, well, actually, this is from another side project, but I have an interest in just sort of collecting in different languages how people understand these different words like artificial or intelligence, human and machine. Um, as part of this other project on AI metaphors, I asked I ask people in workshops, if you didn't have the words artificial and intelligence, what would you call it? Um, and I think the point I'm trying to make is how, um, how, how these words have just sort of like totally captured our imagination, but also what the technology is and what we think we must do with it. So, uh, and, and, and in this way, I think these ideas have also come to be deployed very quickly. We know them to be harmful and narrow and exclusionary and as a very highly situated kind of knowledge. So what else might these words mean and how does an expanded understanding of these words allow us to think about what AI is and what it is not? and what it might also include. So um, I'm going to stop this share and then share another screen. I'm gonna actually go to the internet because that was a keynote. So this is the, the project. And of course it's best sort of interacted with and I hope that you will after the talk is over. So in collaboration with uh, Pratyush Raman and Design Beku in Bangalore, uh, we architected this uh, project in terms of its interaction as something that comes built in with this notion um, that Professor Whitelaw talks about that search is ungenerous, he says, or he says that you know, online search is a limited experience um, because, what we, because what a search bar assumes is that you know what you're looking for, you know what you're searching for, just as a conventional dictionary does. But if we wanna think more whimsically, politically, imaginatively, or speculatively, uh, speculatively about AI, how does a visual interface or point of access to an archive of knowledge uh, allow you to do that? Or how does it allow you to not do that? How do you go beyond the limits of the search bar, so to speak? So if you wanna think about AI or learn about AI, how might we disrupt and enrich our knowledge of what this technology might be? And I wanted to con uh, connect AI to diverse histories and practices of computation, technology, culture, and society. 
and there's a fairly well-trod path about of storytelling about AI, one that originates in Dartmouth in 1956, the symbolic and connectionist split, Minsky's manipulations and AI winter, and then very quickly where it, you know, Jeffrey Hinton and computer vision that has to distinguish between blueberry muffins and chihuahuas. So uh, this is very much a sort of humanities project and it's not organized around, you know, questions of regulation of AI or machine learning. And in fact, I want to, I think, try and identify these discursive and semantic anchors that fix AI in particular regulatory regimes. But I'm trying to say, no, don't foreclose it and let it remain experimental and creative. And let us be alert to the homogenous and kind of homogenizing discursive influences around it. So what we did was, um, let me just sort of navigate some of this. So there's the grid view, which is, as I was saying, this, you know, these different entries written by students, uh, many written by, by me. Um, and as anyone who makes any of these projects know, you have to do a lot of this stuff yourself in the back end, which is always a great experience. So this is the grid view. And then, um, and then this is the relational view, as I like to call it. And um, this nice effect of it sort of opening out, this is a force directed graph. And what happens here is if you are to click on something or hover over something here, you see material, but you also see that it's connected to these other things. Alternate history of the Soviet avant-garde, okay. And Karen Barad lecture, great. And physics. And I'm not gonna, well, if you sort of, um, Click on that. Right, okay, so that's that's where it takes you. So what we're seeing here is actually a relationship between the two. So the relational view is a visualization of metadata from the grid view. So when we wrote the entries for the grid view, um, each piece is about 300 or 400 words that students wrote, and they were given the, the sort of guidance or direction to uh, heavily hyperlink um, their, their entries. And each hyperlink is associated with about four or five tags, uh, word tags. And what you're seeing in this force directed graph in this visualization is the representation of those of the tags itself. So you're not seeing the dictionary entries, you're seeing um, the tags associated with hyperlinks in each of those entries. So this is how we're trying to sort of move outside to sort of unexpected or, um, yeah, to sort of slightly fork how we would understand what AI is. And I'd like to think about the difference or the similarity between the, the grid view and the relational view in terms of um, the difference between swimming in a pool and swimming in the open ocean. So as a pedagogical project, what I've tried to do since then is add more content to the site. And this is sort of more recently um, as I'm finishing my dissertation as well in the last few months. So I could have and probably should have just commissioned people to write entries, but I wanted to continue to make it like a space for teaching and learning. So I had three scholars and designers give, uh, give talks that I hope would then generate um, or sort of serve as prompts for more uh, for more entries. So we call that the spring sessions, and we had we had these great uh, three great talks, and the talks were small and intense and offered a lot uh, to me and I think those of us who were there. And some of these are not directly connected in a very obvious sort of way to what AI is, um, like you know Edward Glissant's work and uh, the Haitian Revolution and cybernetics is not something you come across quite often. Uh, but as somebody who sits between the humanities with a background in activism, also in media and cultural studies, I want to have these different disciplines talk to each other about AI as media and culture and technology. So um, what I might do in the coming weeks is actually that the talks are now online. Um, well, they, they're going to be online soon. Uh, we'll, we'll have links to them there. And, and what I want to um, sort of highlight in this is that the process of coming up with a dictionary entry is actually where a lot of the work lies. The choices that you have to make about what is helpful and in interesting and enriching to include. And I wanna include uh, and sort of foreground this work of writing 
as a slow personal and thoughtful process of learning for, for students like myself. So for example, um, we have Pedro Oliveira's talk um, here uh, from machine listening to machine listening. And Pedro's work is about the German government's pretty slippery application of Arabic accent recognition by uh, machine learning and natural language processing to identify migrants as actually being from Syria rather than elsewhere in the Arab speaking region. So um, there's, there's a wonderful history to this, to this work that Pedro talks about. And his entire body of work over the past few years has been about this, how do you identify Arabic uh, spoken in Syria as opposed to Arabic spoken in Bahrain or, or Morocco. And, um, and he has a lot of scholar, artistic and scholarly material about this work that's, uh, that's really interesting. But his work exposing that machine learning is, or natural language processing uh, automated in this way, that it is not robust or flawed or discriminatory. I mean, I don't think that's the only story, but his work is about how machine, machine listening uh, is different from human listening and how particular kinds of humans, like those who speak Arabic in a certain way and locating them are produced and identified by machine listening. So for me in writing an entry, I'm thinking about how do I want to position, you know, Pedro's work in relation to what's happening politically in the context of, you know, machine learning and AI. Um, and in fact, I think Pedro's, but I, actually all of the entries could generate, uh, all of the talks could generate a couple of different entries. So I'm trying to sort of locate this as, you know, a dictionary that somebody would be interested in machine learning and natural language processing. Can I tell a particular story about it? But I also want to connect it to borders, migration and coloniality. So the work of this work is to figure out how we want to think and write about these technologies in a way that is critical and reflective and achieves the aims of questioning how we know what AI is and how AI knows and create different ways of knowing. And I'm gonna stop there. <laughs>